Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for links to some great online retailers. There's also individual links for knives that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today I've got a really cool custom knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Skiff Made Blades Culprit, a very, very beautiful, very compelling piece. This knife was sent to me by Levon of the Knife Nuts podcast. I have been mispronouncing his name for a shamefully long time and nobody has corrected me. <laughs> so. That's stupid of me. Sorry about that. Uh, if you don't know uh, what the Knife Nuts podcast is, uh, it's the it's one of the very best uh, knife related podcasts out there. Uh, enormous amount of entertainment to be found there. Please go check them out. Follow them on Instagram. Levon has been great. Levon has been great. Oh my god. Uh, so uh, please uh, check them out. I'd also like to thank Eugene Kwan for providing some uh, information on this. He's also got an excellent video on that, so you should check him out as well. Uh, thanks so much to my generous patrons for supporting me. You can find my Patreon link down in the description. And please follow me on Instagram at Metal underscore Complex. This is the first of my Metal Complex 2.0 reviews. Uh, what does that mean? It means we're going to be moving through some of this starting stuff much faster and getting to the part of the video that you guys care about, which is the knife itself. Uh, so first off, overall length is coming in at about 7 and 3 quarter inches overall. Blade length on this guy is coming in at about 3.25 3 inches overall. It's important to remember that um, this is the culprit. There is a, there is a larger version of, uh, of this knife, kind of. It's, it's a different model called the Accomplice. The Accomplice has uh, a 3.5 inch blade and is a little bit longer overall. Um, let's go ahead and do some size comparisons here. First off, up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. You can see there, size difference between those two. Next up, we're going to do the Spyderco PM2 and Para 3, both at the same time here, so you guys can get a good look. And last but not least, of course, the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, which is going to serve as the larger of the two knives, and the smaller Benchmade Griptilian. All right, how's the action on this guy? The action is quite excellent. This is one of those knives where it's really hard to explain how good you feel about something or how you actually feel about it until you get it in hand. Uh, in my opinion, the flipper tab is shaped beautifully. The detent is perfect, and uh, the action on the way back down is nice and glassy smooth. This is something that I talk about a lot with knives. I do not judge the quality of action on whether or not it falls shut. There are different levels of fall shut action that can be achieved in budget knives, in mid-range knives, and high-end knives, and custom knives, right? What I look for is how much friction is actually going on inside of the pivots, right? Whether or not I can feel it. Um, more importantly, the relationship between the flipper tab positioning and shape and the weight and mass of the blade, right? How easy it is to flip and how, um, I guess, responsive it is, how reliable it is. And this is perfect. It's incredibly smooth. A lot of you guys know uh, Skiff Made Blades. Uh, they, they, or you guys have heard of Skiff Bearings. You can actually go to their website, and check out the different bearings that he offers in different sizes, right? In some cases, you can actually find a set of custom skiff bearings for one of your own knives. Uh, but you'll have to check out, you know, the measurements, things like that. But they are available uh, on his website. And people talk about, you know, the skiff bearings, skiff bearings. I remember hearing that all the time. I was like, what's the deal with these? Now I get it. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, it's really amazing. Um, the, the action, like I said, it's not something that's completely and totally falls shut, but that's fine with me. I like a slow, controlled action, and I like to make sure that there's no excess grittiness or bumpiness or lumpiness inside of there. It is perfectly consistent from here all the way down to the closed position, and the detent strength is perfect. Very, very impressive. Again, it's one, I need to emphasize this. It's one of those things where if you're looking at this and you're like, I just see another titanium frame lock flipper, right? And it's obviously got some extra elements to it. Until you handle it, it's not nearly as apparent. I'll admit, when I looked at this the first time, I thought, that's interesting. It looks pretty nice. I don't know what I think about the shape and the overall profile. And then I got it in hand, and I just there was all this new love, this new attraction uh, for me. And a lot of it had to do with experiencing everything up close, but also the action. Just the feeling of it. It's very, very good. This is an expensive knife. We're going to talk about the price here, uh, but for those of you who are, you know, familiar with uh, the really, really high-end knives and you know, paying multiple hundreds or over a thousand dollars in some cases, right? You have expectations. Uh, this knife is is going to meet those expectations. It is very, very high quality, very good feeling in hand. Absolutely. 
Um, I would do a hardware check for you guys, but I'm not going to touch this knife with my tools. You can pick up my tools down in the description if you want to. They're very high quality and very recommendable. They're also very inexpensive. The pivot is a T15, which is fantastic. I love large fasteners. And then the body screws are all T8, which is something that I also like. Uh, so that's fantastic. Not a lot of hardware on there, and it's simple uh, uh, sandwich construction titanium frame lock, so it shouldn't be a problem. Carry profile up against the Spyderco Para 3. We'll do thickness here real quick. You can see here that it's really just about the exact same thickness as the Spyderco Para 3, so that's fine. And length and height up against the Spyderco PM2 and Para 3. You can see here that it's actually not quite as long as the PM2 and honestly just a hair longer than the Para 3. Height, even including the flipper tab, is really not that big of a deal. Uh, as I usually say, if you're carrying uh, multiple things or at least one other object in your knife pocket alongside your knife, you might have an issue with it. If you're like me and you only carry a knife in your knife pocket, that's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, this is a, I would call this a full size knife. So, you know, for legality reasons, be sure you know whether or not you can actually carry this knife in your local area. This is all unmilled titanium. Give you guys a look at the inside here real quick. Uh, and uh, honestly, that's not really that big of a deal to me, but it is going to be for some people. So weight on this guy coming in at 4.41 ounces, which is right up my alley. That's going to be too heavy for some people, and it's going to be just right for other people. Do that. Do with that information what you will. All right, um, let's go ahead and talk about the anatomy here. This is uh, this is why I'm going to do my reviews this way from now on. It just goes a little bit faster. I know that the main, you know, there, there's two main areas, right? I'm wiping this off. There's two main areas that are attracting people to this blade. Number one, uh, the blade itself, of course, in this beautiful uh, hand rub satin finish. It's also, I, I should point this out. This is information that I got from Eugene's video. Uh, this is a father and son uh, uh, ordeal here with the creation of this knife. Uh, it's my understanding that the father is responsible for everything from, you know, the pivot forward. Um, so the blade and the finish work and the blade, things like that. And then the sun does, you know, from this area back. That's interesting. That's pretty neat. These are made in the United States in New York state. Uh, if anybody was wondering, uh, there's some CNC and there's also some handwork. So define this how you will. Some people are going to call it custom. Some people are going to call it semi-custom mid tech, whatever. There's a lot of extra work that goes into something like this. So couple that with the fact that it's made in the United States, right? And that this is, as far as I understand, this is a small, uh, operation. It's not a large scale operation. Yeah, you're going to pay some extra money for it. That's just, that's going to be the way that it is. Um, but when I see things like this beautiful pivot, you can see how this is, how this is, we've got the, those, those lines in there. And then it comes out to these, uh, the, the rings that are a little bit higher, the anodizing that's done and the contrast here and the polishing, man, that pivot looks good to some people. You know, the pivot is going to be too big and too much of an attention grabber. Um, I honestly, I, I really like it. And it makes me want to look at it. It makes me want to look closely and just appreciate, you know, what's been done here. And I, <laughs> I just really, uh, I'm really attracted to it. Um, it does kind of look like the captain America shield. I don't really have a problem with that. I, th I think it's cool. Um, elements like this, you know, in the backspace or in this extra work is going to add uh, cost to it. And as is the case with most uh, custom knives or all custom knives, the more work that goes into the knife, the more that you're going to pay for it. It's not something that's stamped and pressed and done quickly. It's something that's, you know, there's a, there's a process to it. There's a lot of extra elements involved. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's something that you're going to pay more money for. <laughs> The milling that's on the titanium is also very, very beautiful. The edges, by the way, are nicely knocked down. There's no, I, I'm not feeling any sharp spots or hot spots. You know, even on the flipper tab, you can see they've knocked the corners down, everything like that. Um, I really like this milling pad. I, I've said this a million times. I love textured titanium. I think it's beautiful. In this case, the lines actually do provide uh, a little bit of meaningful traction. Um, as far as ergonomics go, I mean, the shape of the handle is a bit awkward looking. But when you pick it up, it does make sense. I'm not going to say it's the most beautifully ergonomic uh, handle shape in the entire world, but am I able to hold on to the knife? Does it feel natural? Yes, absolutely. And I'm not feeling any area of the knife that's uncomfortable or sharp. I'm really glad that they decided not to put jimping on this um, flipper tab because of the shape of it, you know, when the knife is deployed how it sort of hooks around your finger. Had they put jimping on this, I think it would have been a problem, but it's not. It's actually very comfortable. And I like this area right here, how it's kind of a, a, a choil, right? In any case, it's very comfortable. And I'm, you know, even though you can see how it sort of transitions here because there's no sharpening choil, which some people get bent out of shape about. Truthfully, I, I don't really care that much. 
I like to see when it's there, but personally, if it's not there, you know, okay, whatever. Um, but this area right here, there's plenty of room for your index finger, and you can absolutely get the entirety of the meat of your finger right up behind the cutting edge. So if you're going to do those heavy pressure sort of you know, push cuts, things like that, or you're going to do some close-up detail work, yeah, you can make full use of that. That area is very, very comfortable. Honestly, this area, holding it right here, it's okay. But this area up here, this is the most comfortable ergonomic position for this knife. I really, really like that. I, I have a preference for choils and I have a preference for being able to get right up behind the edge. So that's something that I really, really appreciate. The blade, which is very beautiful, but it's got my gross fingerprints all over it. So I've got to clean that off here real quick. This, I'm, here's the thing. So I, I always talk about like, I'm bored of satin finishes and I like to see tumbling in different interesting uh, finishes. A, a, a standard belt satin finish is very different to me than a hand rub satin finish. Uh, and if it's going to be hand rub satin, I like to see that all these lines are perfectly straight. Uh, we don't want to see, you know, variations, lines straying off and go in different directions because that doesn't look good. In this case, it is perfect. This is a perfect hand rub satin finish blade. It's very beautiful. This is different to me. Again, repeating myself, this is different to me than a, uh, than a belt satin finish. This looks substantially better, substantially better. And it also is going to add cost to your knife because like I said, it's hand done. Somebody had to take time to do this by hand. It's going to be much longer. Uh, it's going to be a much longer process than just, you know, running it through a belt or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, it looks good. I mean, it was worth it. Absolutely. Edges up here or corners nicely knocked down. We have a, a little bit of ever so slight crowning on the uh, blade here. It looks like it's flat. It's actually crowned just a little bit and that's beautiful. You get that nice reflectivity. The polishing that's going on on the blade, right? You can see it on the spine uh, and on the flat. Man, the polishing is excellent. They do that all the way around, all the way through the knife right there. I love that little touch right there. He puts skiff on the tang, which is cool because there's a lot of uh, surface area on, on a blade where you could put it and it could just ruin the aesthetic of the knife. Sometimes, like on production knives, I don't mind the billboarding, but on knives like this, people are buying them because they want to appreciate the incredible aesthetic, right? That's what they want. Oh, look at the reflectivity on this is beautiful. <laughs> they want to appreciate the aesthetic, right? So they don't want like Microtech, bleh, patent number and website. and they, they don't want to see that all over the knife, right? So this is a nice touch, how they just put skiff right there. That's cool. The polishing all the way around. Something I appreciate, right? Those are surfaces they could have just left. I'm not going to say unfinished, just not polished. They could have. And honestly, somebody like me would be like, yeah, that's what I expect in that area. So whatever. But they went ahead and <laughs> all of these areas are so nicely polished. It's just beautiful. I love that. Um, this is a, a different style of drop point blade where we've got this, uh, the flat runs out about 40% the length of the blade. And then you have this enormous swedge that comes all the way back up here. Uh, the, the, the shape of the blade is not one that initially attracts me, but you know, like I said, I got this in hand and got it out. And I was like, holy cow, I love this. And, and I honestly, I'd never seen this knife up until I, you know, uh, Levin sent it to me. And, uh, you know, I took a look at it. But I remember thinking if I saw a picture of this, I'd think that's neat. Looks like it's made well. Not really my cup of tea in terms of profile, right? That was what I was thinking. But I'm so glad that I got an opportunity to experience it because I love this so much more than I initially would have. You know, you guys know what I mean, right? Sometimes you make your purchase decisions entirely off the aesthetic, right? And then you, you're curious about the, the extra elements, things like that. You go see what people say, you get it in hand, right? This was, I, I guess, kind of backwards from that for me. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, very, very nice. The blade is absolutely perfect. The edge is perfect. The cutting uh, bevel, right? It's even, it looks like there might be a slight recurve in this blade. No, there isn't. The edge is actually completely straight. Um, and uh, honestly, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Um, I This isn't, when I say overview, like when I started this video and I said overview, it's because that's what it is. It's an overview. I generally don't do a full review on custom knives. I like to just appreciate them for the work that went into them. We're in a totally different ballpark in terms of, you know, this realm, this world, right? The knife world oftentimes, I mean, I think this goes without saying that less expensive knives more often get used as tools uh, versus more expensive knives. And the people who are buying more expensive knives might use them, might not use them, might just buy them to appreciate what they are, right? Um, but that's what I found to be often the case. And maybe that's just my perspective. 
but I like to appreciate more so the work that goes into them uh, and, and less, you know, how, how well is this going to work as a tool. But as it turns out, this actually would function perfectly fine as a tool. In fact, it would be an excellent tool for those who actually decide to make, you know, a purchase uh, with, the, with this company, with Skip Made Blades, and then actually go out and use it. It's going to be great. The reason for that long buildup is uh, I don't know what the blade steel is, and honestly, on a knife like this, I'm going to trust that it's something that we expect it to be. You know, a lot of uh, you know higher end knives use uh, M390 and N20 CV, but they'll also use blade steels like uh, CPM 154 or RWL 34, and sometimes it's something different, right? It matters much less to me what the blade steel is in this case. Um, generally speaking, you know, with higher end knives, uh, the heat treat is going to be done basically perfect. It's often, more often than not, it's actually the, the rock welds uh, a little bit higher than what you'd normally see on a production blade. So, for example, production M390 tends to hover around 59, 60, 61. Oftentimes on, uh, you know, a custom knife, uh, the M390 will be heat treated to 62, uh, 63 rock welds, something like that. I'm not saying that's what this is. I'm just giving you an example. It, oftentimes, this blade steel composition is going to perform better than, you know, uh, the same composition on a production knife because the heat treat is just it's just better it's not done in massive you know large batch or anything like that i'm speculating and i'm just talking now none of this is actually factual maybe i'm trying to skirt around the fact that i don't know what the blade steel is but that's okay because that's not the uh the point here anyways moving on love the uh, in this case we have the contrast between the blue titanium uh, uh hardware i'm sure people are wondering you're like you said this was going to be faster the intro, <laughs> the initial part of my review is going to be faster, but you can bet that's to make room for everything that I want to say about these knives. Still going to be a 20 minute video, uh, just not going to spend so much time in the initial part, right? But anyways, blue contrast uh, with the uh, titanium here looks excellent. Like I said, love the size of the hardware. Backspacer is beautiful. We have this sort of combination purple and blue depending on, come on now, can we focus? Can we well, what's the deal here? <laughs> my, my, my camera loves to get fixated on the background. Um, but yeah, the backspacer looks absolutely beautiful. You can see that we've got this nice polishing going on. We have blue, and then it comes up to sort of a purple peak. Really excellent. That is just absolutely stunning. I love that. And I think it kind of changes color a little bit depending on, you know, the angle. The other side, we have a sort of matte uh, blue anodized pocket clip that has the exact same texturing as the uh, the, the handle um, and the uh, or the scale. Sorry, underneath the pocket clip, you can see there's that little flat area, so you're not actually running, the, you know, pinching the texturing up against your uh, your pocket. So it's not going to fray your pockets uh, nearly as aggressively as if it were just running on the textured surface. That's a nice little touch. We've got two screws. Two T8 screws holding in the pocket clip. This isn't a knife that carries deep, but it's also not a knife that I'd say carries shallow. There's a reasonable amount of knife sticking up out of your pocket. The pocket clip is long. It's much longer than I think most people would expect on a, a knife like this. But because of the shape of it, they do do a continuous ramp, so that's nice. Not a lot of room to get over a pocket seam, but it is a continuous ramp, so that's nice. No sharpness whatsoever right here. And it's not a hot spot. It's just not something that I my, my hand wants to complain about. So I don't really have a problem with the length of the pocket clip. Inside, I'm sure some people kind of caught a little bit here. Let me get my flashlight. Inside, we can see it says culprit and then number 49. These are numbers. And then on the other side, it's actually, if we can see in there, it's actually the skiff sailboat. So that's nice that they put that in there. Um, it's also, it's nice that it's not on the blade, right? Skiff culprit number 49 and then the sailboat, which honestly, the, the, I think the sailboat wouldn't have bothered me too much on the blade. Right, but what I'm saying is, is I'm just glad that they left all of that off of the knife, so we can appreciate uh, this thing for the uh, beautiful uh, mastery, uh, beautiful uh, work of art that it actually is. Right, we get to appreciate the satin finish on the blade. We get to appreciate the pivot where our eyes aren't being drawn away uh, by branding or logos or anything like that. So that's wonderful. Um, what was the next thing I wanted to point out? Oh yeah, so there's no steel lock bar insert on this guy, which is something that I truly is. I don't care. It's fine. The titanium lock face, I'm sure, is carbonized. Um, it's continued to lock up very early. Right here, you can see it's locking up at maybe like 15 to 20%. And over time, you know, it, truthfully, this this can't, thing comes ever so slightly off center, but I, I, I think I can just barely, I've been able to actually use my finger 
can't do this. And I think the blade actually will come back to, yeah, there you go. The blade will actually come back to center. Um, so it's just something that probably needs a little bit of Loctite, which is completely fine. It doesn't bother. A lot of people say, it should come center and stay center and it should never. No, I mean, listen, I don't know how, how long Levon's had this, but if he's going to sit around and flip it all the time, which is what I would do with it, it's understandable with any knife that it might come off center just a little bit, in which case you can simply take the pivot out, add a little bit of blue Loctite, set it back in, and it's going to be fine. Um, but there is a position for the uh, the pivot where it actually, the, the blade does come perfectly center, so I'm not going to count it off for that. What I was going to say was is that there's no lock bar stabilizer, and you might think there's probably no over travel stop, but actually I found that the pivot is likely what's acting as the over travel stop, which is great. Um, the, the lock bar insert is something I could take or leave, but I really do like having a lock bar, uh, uh, not necessarily a stabilizer, but an over travel stop, just in case while I'm sitting around messing with it, I accidentally bend it too far. Because if you do that, you overbend the titanium lock bar, then you're going to have lock up issues. So it's nice, even, even though that's a very unlikely situation, it's nice that that is acting as the over travel stop so that um, we just don't run into that. Lock up is absolutely solid. Uh, I'm just going to have to touch the blade. Absolutely solid. No blade play up, down, left, or right. And I believe, boy, I really knocked the camera there. I believe, yeah, the stop pin is internal. You guys are probably not going to be able to see it because of how close, because of the light and how close everything is together. I'll just kind of point to where it is because I can just barely see it in my light. The lock, I'm sorry, the uh, the stop pin is actually right here. It's fixed in place, so it contacts. You know, it's it's one of those where the blade has a cutout and the 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 stop pin sort of rides on that cutout. Um, so that's great. Um, it's nice. It's not being shown. Not that a visible uh, stop pin is something that you should be concerned with, um, but uh, it's just not visible. The whole thing looks very clean. Very. The construction is simple, so that you can appreciate all of these uh, these aesthetic, you know, features, and that's that's cool. I appreciate that. So, uh, what do these come in at and where can you get them? Uh, the best thing that you can do is follow Skiffmade Blades on Instagram. You can also check out their websites. Periodically, they have things available. Uh, and like I said, including those bearings. So, that's something that's, that's pretty cool, worth checking out. Um, but contact them uh, on Instagram for information on specific information on pricing. It's my understanding, and I got this information from Eugene Kwan. These knives start most basic version of these knives start at $750, which honestly was pretty surprising. I asked uh, a question in the group that I'm in, which includes a lot of the reviewers that you guys have come to know. I said, what do they start at? I'm going to guess they start at about 1000 And Eugene said, actually, they start at about 750 which did surprise me. I, I was not uh, expecting to hear that. That's pretty cool. But that's for an incredibly basic version of this knife. You're going to get all the, the same level of functionality and that same feeling that I was describing earlier on in the video. Um, but as far as a, like a lot of these really, really beautiful features, I mean, you're going to be paying for that. The, 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 the work on the, this is not a basic version of the knife, right? So uh, hand rub satin finish, I'm also going to guess is not basic. So you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for the pivot. You're also going to pay extra for the backspacer setup. Absolutely. So this version here, uh, it would not surprise me if it came in well over $1,000, but I think that's completely and totally justified. Considering what I'm looking at here, the action, stuff like that, right? If, I, if it were me looking for a custom knife uh, and, uh, you know, I was looking in this ballpark for price and I, I forked that money over and this arrived in the mail, would I be happy with it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this is something that Eugene pointed out in his video. I gotta say, I agree with him. There is an area right here where you can just barely touch the tip. Now, it's not, uh, you're not, that's, that's not a likely circumstance, right? In a situation where you're gonna be dragging your finger across that point. But I think that area just needs to be changed either, you know, in terms of the blade or in terms of the handle, um, to, uh, keep that from being so close. I think it's a much bigger deal when uh, blades are exposed back here, because I think it's much more likely you might accidentally run your finger across this area right here um, and accidentally touch the blade or cut yourself. It's obviously not the case here. Much less likely you're gonna run your finger into that tip, but I, I think that would be might be a, a good idea to maybe change that up just a little bit. Other than that though, this is excellent. Whether you're interested in this knife because you're an enthusiast and you just like all these elements, you just wanna have it around in your collection, you just wanna enjoy it, look at it, flip it, just experience it. I think that's a you know a fine reason to pick up something like this. 
But if you're actually going to take it out and use it, I think this thing makes a wonderful, or will make a wonderful tool. We didn't really talk about this, but the access to the uh, the frame lock, this area right here, is just beautiful. There's no double clutch. Very easy to get the blade out. It only takes a little bit of encouragement to get that blade to fall, and you know that's just going to get better over time. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. That action is perfect to me. Absolutely wonderful. Very, very buttery, glassy smooth, which is really satisfying. I'll take that over a knife that falls shut and has a little bit of a, you know, kind of the squeak or the bumpy, the gritting, right? That exists sometimes in knives that have false shut action, which is why I don't put so much emphasis on just the false shuttiness. I want it to be consistently smooth and I want it to deploy readily, uh, aggressively, right? And dependable, in a dependable fashion. <laughs> that's how I want it to feel. So that's great. Um, I think this is, this is excellent. Like I said, if you're looking to pick something up, you know, because you want to use it, there's a lot of crazy knives out there you can spend a lot of money on, and a lot of them are more or less usable, but this is definitely geared towards function. This is a, definitely designed with the end user in mind, and I think, uh, you know, people who do pick that up, pick this knife up or a variant of it and decide to use it are going to be really, really happy. This is beautiful. I'm so glad I got an opportunity to experience this because I feel like, you know, the more I hear, you know, skiff knives or skiff made blades, I, I just felt like I was left out and I should have, you know, uh, known more about um, Stephen Skiff. And I'm, I'm glad that I got to experience this. It makes me uh, really want to experience more uh, from the maker. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Thanks again to uh, Levin of the Knife Nuts podcast. Seriously, check out this podcast. If, you, if you've never listened, you're missing out. I think that's going to be pretty much it. I think I covered everything that I was confident in covering. Um, so yeah, if you guys, uh, make sure to follow me on Instagram, by the way, if you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching everybody and have a great day.